Thanks for inviting me, Dr. Grant. Let's make sure this is working here. Okay. So I just wanted to lay out for you in the next half hour sort of my approach to pediatric headache management and uh, to just say I have no disclosures, no financial relationships, or I'm not going to be talking about any investigative uses. So as an outline of what I really wanted to point out here, uh, the first thing I always want to talk about when I see a patient with, with headache is looking for secondary headaches. So for a child that's never had headache and suddenly starts to have headache, what's going on? Is there something else going on that's causing these headaches? And sometimes it's Chiari. That could be a secondary headache. But there are other things as well. So I always want to think about that. My second point is to think of treatment in a three-pronged approach. And I'll lay that out for you as well. Uh, my third point is to talk about a couple of times where headaches don't respond to treatment. What, what else can we think about there? And uh, the last point is, I think, setting expectations. Because headaches are a chronic pain disorder, and sometimes those take a while to work out. Okay. So I think uh, your pediatricians will often think about some of these uh, triggers for secondary headaches. And so a lot of times when kids come to me, these have already been looked at, right? So for a child who's never had headaches, who starts to have headaches, what's going on? Is it allergies? Is it always happening during hay fever season? Uh, is there a sinus infection going on? Is there eye strain, right? Not just that kids might need glasses, but there's a lot of computer vision syndrome going on these days, right? Where kids are staring at the screen. Um, is there anemia? Are there thyroid problems? Liver, kidney, rheumatologic. So I think a lot of those things get looked at uh, on first presentation of headache for children. Then I try to help out a bit with thinking about, well, what else? What else could be causes? And sometimes people don't think about things like sleep. So if you have chronic snoring and apnea at night and you're not quite getting enough oxygen, that can be a trigger for headaches. Uh, if you have teeth grinding, if you have jaw issues, if you have dental issues, those are actually all triggers uh, for headache as well. Um, environmental causes, carbon monoxide, lead, and even sometimes I'll get a history of a mild head trauma that kicks off headaches in kids that are prone to get headaches. Maybe they fell off the uh, jungle gym or something, and that's the start of, of, their, of their headaches. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about cranial neuralgias. Those are... Um, uh, problems with nerves that are in your, uh, uh, around your head or your scalp. And then functional, meaning um, are the headaches actually in a kid who uh, has, a, has some sort of stressor and tends to manifest their stress by saying they have headaches or having, saying that they have stomach aches? Um, and is there something underneath that, that? That is what we really need to get at. OK, so we've, we've kind of gone through that. We've talked to the family and the kid about all of these things. And we're not coming up with a whole lot. Um, or maybe it's a kid that has always kind of had headaches when they're running around too much, but now their headaches are worse. So what could be going on there? Could it be childhood migraine, right? So some people say, oh, kids can't have migraines. That's definitely not true. Children definitely can. And I was just pointing out in this slide, um, in adults versus kids, what are the characteristics of migraine? So the top is me. The bottom is my daughter. Um, and so for me, I would get, you know, I get episodic, recurrent, pulsatile headaches. Um, maybe some nausea, some lightened sound sensitivity, definitely worsened with exercise in, and help by sleep. So that's your classic adult sort of migraine, right? In children, actually, it, uh, it's a little bit more predominant in boys, 60%, whereas in, women, in, uh, in adults, uh, more in women. And then kids may not get that classic aura. So what the parents will say, instead of saying you know, nausea, light, and sound sensitivity, they'll say, oh, I pick them up from school. And they've got that pale, pale look. And they've got the, the bags under their eyes. And they just look, they're either irritable or they're listless. And that's sort of their aura. That's sort of what precedes their headache, rather than the classic light and sound sensitivity, although some kids get that as well. Um, fortunately, their attacks typically are shorter, sometimes just lasting a few minutes to hours. And overall, better prognosis so that they usually um, do better with them than adults do. So that's good news. OK. So we've sort of talked about trying to figure out what kind of headache is going on, what, what might be causing the headaches. Do they maybe have an underlying headache disorder like migraines? Um, and then usually we turn to sort of the headache treatment plan. So the reason I put it in three prongs is because I try and think of it in that way. The first prong is really trying to identify triggers, right? And we've talked some about that already in terms of uh, are there secondary headaches going on, but also what are the triggers for their 
regu for their migraines or their primary headache problems. Um, and then number two is what we call abortive treatment. That means trying to stop the headache. Do we have a good plan for that? When your child is complaining of headache, what do we do there? And then number three is really prevention. How do we lessen these headaches? How do we make their brains less sensitive towards getting headaches? And I think that includes both non-medication and medication techniques. So I'm going to go through these three prongs here. So talking about triggers, I think we've all probably <clears throat> uh, thought of these because people will tell me, oh yeah, I don't get migraines. I only get headaches when I uh, don't eat enough or when I don't get enough sleep or things like that. Well, those are triggers for migraines. Those are triggers for headaches. Stress, anxiety, um, lack of sleep, school work, uh, and uh, glare, weather changes. All of these are common triggers for headache. And so identifying those in each individual and treating those uh, is key. So also sort of dietary triggers and headache. Uh, what, what's a good sort of way to manage uh, diet with, uh, with headaches? Um, so this is a, a partial list, but I, I tried to italicize some of the ones that are maybe more prominent in children. So MSG, sort of take out uh, fast food might have MSG. Um, sodium nitrate, so processed meats, hot dogs, bacon, ham, those kinds of things. Um, caffeine, so most kids aren't drinking coffee or tea, but all those energy drinks, all those power drinks um, have caffeine or some other stimulant, ginseng, some of these other stimulants that you might not know unless you actually look at the, bo at the uh, bottle. And then uh, simple sugars can also be a trigger. So with, with caffeine and, and sugars, I think you get a bit of a high, right? A little stimulus to the nervous system. And then the crash is often what can trigger the, trigger the headaches or the migraines. And so uh, I often do talk about sort of ra rather than simple sugars, just frequent small meals with complicated carbohydrates. Kind of an even delivery of complicated sugars is, is better. OK, so that was talking about some headache triggers. Uh, next, I was going to talk about sort of the headache action plan. So you, when the headache starts, how do we stop a headache in its tracks? What abortives can we use, right? And a really big uh, point I always want to get across to parents is that you've got to hit it early and you've got to hit it hard. So nobody likes their kids to take medicine, and no kids like to take medicine. So what do people do? They say, oh, we'll ignore them for a while, then we'll give them water, then we'll make them lie down, and then when they're just really bad, then maybe we'll give them a half pill of Tylenol. And that doesn't work. And it, and it really shouldn't work, because the idea with headaches is that you really have to hit it early. Once the headache's been going for a while, then it's really hard for that medication to work. And so I try and kind of change people's thought process. Actually, you're doing a better service to your child if you actually give them the medicine at the beginning, and you give them a big dose. So you can stop the headache in its tracks, and the kid can go out and play again. So that's uh, one really important thing about those medicines. Um, and the next slide was, uh, is just a um, slide showing the different medications that have been used in uh, randomized trials uh, for pediatric, for kids with uh, pediatric migraine. And so you can see sort of the percentage of pain relief is somewhere around 50 to 80% for these different medications. Um, the bottom four are triptans, which are medicines that were designed uh, just for migraine. Then we've got uh, Tylenol and ibuprofen uh, at the top. We've got an IV form of NSAID, ketorolac, and then prochlorperazine or compazine, which is a dopamine medication. Uh, but those two are IV, so it's not something you're going to be giving at home. That would be in the emergency room. So next, I was going to talk a bit about headache prevention. And I think the key here is that there's many modalities that we use. Um, I share lots of patients with Dr. Galeanu in the pain clinic. And they've got, a fat, they've got an amazing access to all of these treatments. Their pain psychologists are trained in many of these things. The anesthesiologists, like Dr. Galeanu, uh, can do acupuncture. And uh, there's also a physical therapist there who evaluates patients. So I think there's a whole bunch of other uh, modalities we can bring. Nutraceuticals means uh, vitamins or herbs or supplements. And then at the bottom, I put uh, medications. So when we talk about chronic headache, the sort of research definition of chronic migraine 
is more than 15 days of headache per month for more than three months with the features of migraine headache on at least eight days per month. So that's the technical definition of chronic migraine. Um, the problem, though, is that when we talk about preventative measures here, right, all these different therapies we have, none of them work right away. None of them stop headaches in their tracks, right? That was the abortive medications. Now, what's the problem with the abortive medications? Well, if you take them too much, it's just like caffeine or sugars. Your body gets used to those medicines, and you actually then can crash when you're not taking the medicines. So that's called medication overuse. So we can't, we can't be using uh, Advil every day, right? Um, but then these treatments, these prevention treatments, don't work right away. So what do we do in the middle there? So when we're trying to break the headache cycle, when the kid's got really um, persistent headaches, there are a few strategies that we use. So one you might hear about is naproxen or Aleve. So that's like ibuprofen, that's an NSAID, but it seems to be the one that's least likely to cause medication overuse. So we sometimes will do a trial of that for two to eight weeks of taking it around the clock, regardless of if you have a headache at the moment or not, just taking it and trying to use that to break this headache cycle that's going on. A second option that we sometimes use is greater occipital nerve injections. Uh, usually the pain clinic does, does those for me. So back in the back of your uh, uh, scalp, you have uh, the greater occipital nerves that come up there and then kind of, they're the sensory nerves. They perceive the pain from the, from the back of the scalp. And so doing injections there can actually, uh, uh, numbing injections there can actually break a migraine or break a headache cycle as well um, if there's a component of tenderness or dysfunction back there. Um, and then by the time that uh, injection wears off, then hopefully your preventative treatments have kicked in. And then the last uh, uh, measure on my list here is DHE, or dihydroergotamine. That's a medicine that helps to shrink down blood vessels and can be very helpful in breaking chronic migraines. But it's an IV, it's an intravenous medication, and it's actually kind of hard on your blood vessels as well. So that's a medicine that we save for uh, in the hospital if we need to do that. So any of, any of these uh, can be used as a bridge to help get from the everyday headache uh, to get you through to when the preventatives kick in. So then um, I was going to talk quickly about some of the medications that folks use for uh, headache prevention in children. So if children are younger, usually less than six, we often think about a medicine called ciproheptadine or periactin. That's an antihistamine, so it's in the same class as Benadryl or medications like that. Um, and so it can be uh, super sedating, make kids really sleepy and dizzy. Um, it, for some kids, a pro is weight gain, so it increases appetite. So the gastrointestinal doctors, the GI doctors, sometimes use it to help kids eat. Um, but that can be a bad thing uh, for, for some patients as well. So that one is often used for children who are less than six that don't get those side effects as much. Then the only medicine that's actually FDA approved at this time for, it's actually for adolescents, so 12 to 17. There's nothing approved in children less than 12. But for ages 12 to 17, the FDA has approved topiramate or Topamax as a medication for a chronic headache, chronic migraine. So, oh, I forgot to mention, none of these medicines were initially designed for headache. It was all found as, uh, as patients were taking these for other things that it seemed to help with headache. So topiramate was initially actually an epilepsy medication, but they found that at low doses, it can help prevent migraines. Um, that one actually causes some appetite suppression, so you can get some weight loss with that one. Um, but cons are, uh, you can get some slowed thinking, so they call it the tip of the tongue phenomenon, like, oh, I can almost get that word, but I can't quite find that word, it's on the tip of my tongue. So that's something that patients describe sometimes, typically on higher doses of Topamax. Um, you can get pins and, needle, uh, pins and needle feeling in your fingers and toes. And then if you have a tendency towards kidney stones in your family, it can precipitate those. So those are possible downsides of that one. And then there's just two other ones that people think, uh, use frequently. One of those is uh, propranolol or Inderol. That was initially, that's a beta blocker, right? It was a blood pressure medication, but seems to be helpful in preventing headaches and migraines. Um, there's no cognitive. It doesn't tend to make kids sleepy or have slowed thinking, um, but you shouldn't use it if you have a history of asthma. And if you're a super athlete, if you're really active because it's a blood pressure medicine, it might make you feel, have some exercise intolerance when you're taking it. 
Um, and then the last medication that people frequently use is amitriptyline. Some people use nortriptyline, which is a, a relative of amitriptyline. And that was initially an antidepressant, but seems to work really well for neuropathic pain. So, you know, diabetics with nerve pain, it can be helpful with that, and also with headache. Um, cons are it does make you sleep, or it can make you very sleepy. Um, you can get heart rhythm abnormalities, you can get weight gain. And then because it's an antidepressant, like, uh, like most antidepressants for adolescents, there's a black box warning with this uh, sort of catch-22 of it can help with depression, but it can also worsen suicidality. There's that sort of uh, black box warning for all most antidepressants in kids. So again, uh, periactin, uh, top topiramate, propranolol, and amitriptyline, those are probably the medications you would hear about if you're contemplating using a preventative medication. But a lot of kids will say, or a lot of parents will say, but I don't want my child to be taking medications every day. And I think that's a legitimate concern, right? Or uh, my child is very sensitive to medication side effects. Take a medicine, get five side effects. And we actually know that people with migraines are more sensitive to medications in general. So that, that's a valid concern. And maybe you want to know, what are other things I can do to help prevent headaches in my child in addition to taking medications? So I tried to look at uh, sort of evidence-based uh, trials and uh, for what we can do for headaches in children. So one thing is aerobic exercise. If the child is not very active, there was actually the Swedish study that looked at three things, aerobic exercise 40 minutes three times a week versus topiramate versus relaxation therapy. And this was a really big study. It was in adults, but it was uh, quite a lot of, of patients. And all were equally effective in reducing headache. And only topiramate was the one that, it, that was the only one that caused side effects, obviously. So I think that's a great thing. If we can get um, kids to adhere to aerobic exercise, getting your heart rate up 40 minutes three times a week for headache prevention, that's a great, great uh, way we could help. Now, we also talked about physical therapy as a modality. So it makes sense. Neck pain can go along with headache or be the trigger for headaches. And one thing is we know that the occipital nerves, they come out from the cervical spine, right? Come out, uh, go through the neck muscles, and then come out to the back of your head. So if you have neck spasms, neck inflammation, neck problems, that can push on those nerves and aggravate headache. So doing things like uh, stretching and isometric neck exercises to strengthen the neck muscles can help and make them less likely to spasm. So this is a diagram of uh, one of the exercises that's taught. And it's really simple. It's simply pushing against uh, your hand in all four directions for 10 to 15 seconds in each direction, uh, unfortunately, 10 or more times per day. So you're going to be setting your alarm, I suppose, to do something 10 times a day. Um, but improvements can be seen within two weeks. So uh, that is only one of the things that physical therapists can help with. And then what about nutraceuticals? What about herbs, vitamins, supplements? Is there any evidence for that? So I think the big darling recently has been this uh, herb called butterbur. Uh, Petasites is the uh, generic uh, name for that. And uh, it is the only herb or nutraceutical that had enough uh, uh, evidence in adults to be recommended by the American Academy of Neurology. And there are a couple studies in kids as well. However, this herb can have an uh, ingredient, can have these peril pyrolidazine alkaloids in it, and if those aren't purified out, those can cause liver toxicity. So uh, with the, you know, uh, since this is a nutraceutical and not a medication, there are concerns that it's not being regulated as closely. Um, so that, that, is, uh, that is a legitimate concern. Um, another a nutraceutical that can be helpful, especially if there are sleep issues, is melatonin. So uh, sleep is a big trigger for headache, we, all, we don't know exactly how melatonin helps with headache, and there's a bit of plus and minus in the studies right now, but, uh, but I, I really don't see any harm, especially if there's a lot of sleep issues in, in uh, one to three milligrams of melatonin nightly. And then uh, these three all have good evidence. Magnesium is the only one that has an a official randomized control trial. Um, but all of them have been shown to be helpful in some capacity. So magnesium riboflavin or vitamin B2 and coenzyme Q10 
are all uh, supplements, vitamins, nutraceuticals uh, that can be helpful. Uh, now, the caveat is all of these, just like the preventative medications, do take time to work, right? So you still want to give it four to six weeks of taking it regularly and not stop before then to see a benefit. Okay. And then uh, things like cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, the idea with that is really um, being able to monitor your thoughts, your feelings, to identify and challenge your negative thoughts, and then apply problem-solving skills to how to on how to turn those thoughts around. That's, to me, sort of the, the base of cognitive behavioral therapy. And then acceptance commitment therapy is really looking at uh, understanding the limits of your control in your life, um, observing your thoughts without, without uh, sort of trying to evaluate them, being mindful of them, and then coming up to, with a strategy on how to address, uh, address those thoughts and move forward. Uh, biofeedback is another modality that uh, um, has been shown to be at least equal to placebo or relaxation therapy or medication. And that is to learn how to uh, control bodily functions that you're not usually aware of being able to control, right? Things like your heart rate or your body temperature, um, the, the amount that your muscles are uh, uh, tight. Um, so there are different types of biofeedback, um, and learning how to do that can be at at least equal to um, medications. Um, and the treatment effects actually amplify over time. Rather than a medication, when you stop, you don't see any benefit anymore. Things like biofeedback or cognitive behavioral therapy can, can keep going, can keep helping. OK, and then acupuncture. I think Dr. Goli, uh, Goliano talked about that last uh, yesterday. Um, po so possible mechanisms of action seems to activate nervous system structures that are in control of pain perception. So the prefrontal cortex, the rostral anterior cingulate cortex, and the brainstem. Um, it does seem to affect the serotonin as well, right? So the serotonin pro projections in the spinal cord in the brain seem to be affected as well by acupuncture. And then there may be some effects also from going through the skin, just uh, putting needles through the skin. That seems to benefit with pain too, and we don't really understand uh, what that's about. But there is a 2009 Cochrane review that shows it's also at least as effective as medication. Okay. And then people may wonder about Botox. I think that's used quite a lot in adults. And there is a study in uh, adolescents, uh, the preempt trial. Um, they do enroll adolescents in that. And so the idea of the Botox is not just um, uh, relaxing muscles by paralyzing it, but they actually do inhibit the release of other pain uh, proteins, like a substance P and calcitonin gene-related peptide, and, which is implicated in migraine. And so. Um, so it may really benefit in terms of decreasing those, uh, those uh, pain mediators. And then there's sort of two ways that people do the injections. One is called fixed site, and one is called follow the pain. So here's sort of a diagram in one of these papers. Uh, they're, do, they're doing injections in muscles that are at the end of those nerves that sense pain in your uh, scalp, OK? And then the bottom pictures are uh, just uh, doing injections in where, where patients usually have the most pain. OK. So we've talked about a lot of different treatments. And sometimes uh, kids come back, and it's not working. Why, why did our plan not work? Um, so fortunately, there's a paper from neurology just looking at this in patients with refractory headaches. What did we miss? What, and so when I have a patient come back to me, I, I think back through this list here. What did we miss here? So is the diagnosis incomplete or incorrect? Did we not ask about sleep issues the first day? Did we not get the eyes checked? Is there something else going on? Um, is there some exacerbating factors? We didn't really go into caffeine, or we didn't talk about uh, some dietary or lifestyle triggers. Um, we missed some big stressors in the family. Um, is the pharmacotherapy inadequate? Did we not jump on the headache soon enough? Did we not take the medicine long enough? A common issue is people say, oh, I thought I'd just take, it, take the medicine when I have the headache. No, it's a preventative medicine. You've got to take it every day, twice a day. Um, and then the last one is, has the non-pharmacologic treatment been inadequate? Have we not uh, explored those really tight neck muscles and gotten the kid into physical therapy? So I think those are all things to look at when you're having trouble getting a, a hold of that headache.
And then I just wanted to point out a, a couple things here. So sometimes treatment fails because we didn't realize there was medication overuse headache, like we talked about. So those abortive medications, if you use them frequently, they can cause a transformed headache from having occasional headaches to chronic daily headache. And it doesn't take that many days. So an opioid taken eight days a month can cause a medication overuse headache. Triptans, those are things like Imitrex, Sumatriptan, 10 days a month. And uh, NSAIDs, Tylenol, Ibuprofen, 10 to 15 days a month can be enough to tip a headache over into a medication overuse headache. And so the treatment is really to get off of that medicine, um, start a preventative medication or preventative treatments, and maybe try and do a bridge. And then I said we would come back to cranial neuralgias. So what is that? So that's a stabbing, sort of like a nerve burning pain in the distribution of a sensory nerve of the head. And sometimes there's some funny feelings. There's tenderness to palpation over that nerve. And then the pain from that is better if you actually locally inject that nerve with numbing medication, just like when you go to the dentist and they inject those nerves, right? And so this is a diagram of, all, of many of the uh, different sensory nerves on the head. And you can see on the back there the greater occipital nerve. And so these kinds of neurologists can actually contribute to primary headache disorders such as migraine. So a kid comes in to me with migraine, but I feel back here and they say, ouch, that really hurts right there. And when I tap on it, they say, oh, there's a nerve uh, sort of feeling that kind of comes up my scalp. So they've got migraine and they've got occipital neuralgia. Um, I had one patient who would cry when his hair was being cut because he was so sensitive there. Um, so it can be pretty bad. And these occipital nerve injections can temporarily or permanently resolve chronic daily headache. For that patient, uh, a one-time injection did the trick. Um, and there is a paper from 2014 where it helped about 50% of patients with chronic headaches. So sort of the last point I wanted to talk about is setting expectations, because disappointment is when your expectations and reality don't meet. And I really want to uh, let families know about the fact that we really don't understand for how common migraines are. We don't really understand why it happens, right? There's some sort of neural events that happen. And that causes blood vessels to dilate. That causes depression of, of brain activity. That causes more dilation. And then there's some dysregulation of sort of a, of a pathway between the cortex and the brainstem that just sort of perpetuates. Um, and so we're still studying this and trying to understand that. And uh, not only that, but we talked about how migraine or chronic headache is a chronic pain syndrome. So when you've got pain happening, for that much time, you get upregulation of a whole bunch of different pain peptides, inflammatory peptides. It's a whole cascade slash pathway. And that's not going to go away uh, right away. It's going to take time to cause those receptors to deregulate, to cause everything to come down again. So I think trying to help uh, families understand that we really have to stick with it, come up with a nice plan, and stick with it. Um, the idea is that Rome was not built in a day. And getting rid of those uh, chronic headaches is not going to happen either in a day. But it's really um, doing a lot of sleuthing on the part of the family and, uh, and the patient to figure out what are those triggers and really sticking with uh, addressing all the many triggers for headache. And that's the end of my talk. What is the youngest age that you can use um, in biofeedback? Uh, that's a good question. Um, it really is, I think, a question of cooperation, right? Being able to participate. So a mature, I would say I've even had a five or six-year-old be able to do it, but it really requires a lot of participation. So maybe eight as a general rule, yeah. Do you typically have the parent involved during that first session? So I don't actually do the biofeedback, um, although I've been thinking about getting trained in it. Um, the pain psychologists um, at the Stanford Pain Clinic uh, are typically the ones who do do it. And um, I'm not sure whether they have the family there. I think it probably depends on the age of the child. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Did you have? No. <laughs> My son, 
my son gets like a throbbing in the back of his head if he uh, exerts himself or lifts something heavy. What do you think causes that? And, uh, it, and uh -huh. then he usually has a headache for a while after that. Yeah, I would probably have to take a very detailed <laughs> history and physical exam for him. Um, there are things called primary exertional headaches. Um, so uh, on first pass, I might think about that. Um, there's, uh, but I would also want to make sure that there was not a, not a Chiari or a he's, or any he's other had structural problem. Compression already. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, um, it might be primary exertional headache, which is its own category in the whole headache uh, uh, classifications. Um, there are some medications that are used for that. Okay, yeah. thank you. Should I sit down? Yeah. yeah? Why don't we okay. Can I ask one more question? Yeah. Oh, thanks. Have a okay. seat. Oh, yeah. So the whole panel can hear it as well. Okay. Taping okay? Okay, please. Okay. Sure. It's about the headaches. Um, my 12-year-old does not have Chiari. Um, we've already scanned her, um, but she has been having headaches since she was about three. Uh -huh. um, and we are on, the pediatrician finally put us on periactin uh -huh. three times a day. Uh -huh. um, and it works well. However, this past school year, she decided to start playing sports, something she's never done. She's always danced and played guitar, but not done ath athletic um, type activities. And she is, um, that she's complaining a lot now of headaches when she is playing basketball or playing volleyball mm -hmm. or softball. Um, so should I assume that we need to look at switching something with the periactin with um, dosage? Or kind of um, what Bianca was referring to just a minute ago about the exertion kind of headaches. Mm -hmm. should, I, should I assume that it's just because of the exertion or should, should we look at changing something with her medication? Yeah, again, uh, I'd probably talk to your daughter for a long time mm -hmm. and, and uh, go through all these different factors because we know that migraines are worsened by exertion as well. Right. And so, um, uh, and uh, your question as to changing medications, I don't often have 12-year-olds on periactin just mm -hmm. because of uh, some of the side effects. Um, in her case, I might think about some of those nutraceuticals. Right. Uh, putting some of those on board and then maybe trying to come down on the uh, And she does have ADD as well. Okay. And so um, she is on medication for that. Um, and so I think we kind of thought with um, the fact that that was suppressing um, her appetite, that the periactin was probably a good one to put her on mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it would increase her appetite. Yeah. Um, but then she's also at that age hormonally. Yeah. There's and a lot so of I wasn't factors sure if there. all of that was playing a part. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I think it would take a, a bit of sleuthing there. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you to Jang for that great talk. Appreciate it.